Can you imagine, Brother Ted, being on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus himself, and then all of a sudden two guys of the Old Testament, been dead for a long time, appeared in glory and talking to Jesus, and the Shekinah glory cloud of God is hovering around over on that mountain, and you're all there fast asleep. I want to tell you some of the church is asleep today. People are coming to church today asleep.
Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and open them to the book of Luke. Dr. Luke, Physician Luke, Luke chapter 9. We have a wonderful chapter here. We're going to be looking at almost the entire chapter. Now, don't worry, we're not going verse by verse, uh, because we'd be here until tonight. Uh, But that's all right. We are going to look at several verses in here as we take a look at, They had it, and they lost it. They had it, and they lost it. Now, if you find Luke chapter 9, we're just going to read the first couple of verses here, if you would, with me. Uh, Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse number 1, if you would, please. Then he called his twelve disciples together. How many of you have been called today? If you've been saved, you've been called. How many of you are a disciple today? If you're saved, you're a disciple. So this applies to you. Hello? Okay. Then he called the twelve disciples together, and then notice what he did. He gave them. Who's the them? The disciples. Are you a disciple? Say, that's me. Okay. Then he gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. See, Jesus never sends you out that he doesn't equip you. See, he equipped them first and then he sent them out. Now, he sent them, but now it's up to them to obey that. Amen? So let's see if they're obedient. Drop down to verse 6. And they departed, and they went through the towns. And what did they do, church? Preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. The gospel comes first. Now, real quickly, what did he do? He called them. Amen? The disciples. And what did he give them? He gave them power and what? Authority over who and what? All devils, and to cure diseases, and to heal the sick. And he sent them out to preach the gospel, and they went. Now drop down to verse 40 with me. Everybody in verse 40? And I besought thy disciples to cast him out. Circle the next phrase. And they could not. What happened between verses 1 and 2 and verse 40? Something happened. Let me ask you now. Did not he give them all power and authority over demons and devils? Yes or no? Then what happened by the time we got to verse 40? And a man has a son that's possessed with a demon. He approaches the disciples and he says, Fellas, I would appreciate it if you would cast out this demon out of my son. And here's this uh, insult and, and indictment against them that they could not. In other words, you see, they had all power, but they lost it. How did they lose it? Can they get it back? We're going to look at that today because I believe in the lives of believers. God has called me. I'm a disciple. He's given me power and authority. But there are times in my life, and the reason why he gives us that to us, ladies and gentlemen, is to fight the battle that we're in. We're in a spiritual battle. We're in warfare. We're in combat, if you please. We've got situations, circumstances, problems, pressure, stress, anxiety, worry, frustration. And I mean, I'm telling you, God's people today in the church are living defeated lives. And we're living in defeat because we've lost our power. God has given the church everything it needs and has equipped it with everything it needs, but we've lost our power. Would you agree with that? I mean, today, believers, as I talk to them, man, they're struggling with everything in the world in their life, and they don't need it. What's happening is that they're being, they're being become more overcome than they're being become overcomers. In 1 John, John says we're to be overcomers. Jesus said in Revelation to the seven churches seven times, he that overcometh, he that overcometh. In other words, and John says we're to be overcomers, but i got a feeling that most of the churches today and believers aren't overcoming. They're being overcome. I have a feeling today that most of us are being overwhelmed with our situations and our, 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 and our uh, circumstances that are overwhelming us rather than us overwhelming them. 
I've got a feeling that today as we're in the battle, we're losing more of the battle than we're winning the battle. You see, uh, we, we've won the war. Amen. We know that. We've won the wars over. We've won the war. Jesus won the war at Calvary, my friend. And not just there. He won it the day he arose out of the grave alive and victorious. The war was over. The enemy was defeated once and for all. But we've got a lot of battles to go through. And Christians are losing the battle. And I believe it's because we've lost our power. We don't have the power. Let me demonstrate it to you a little bit. If you would, please. If you allow me to do so. Amen? All right. What do we have here? This is a fairly new Dwight drill motor. Say that with me. It's a drill motor. Now, this has been created, manufactured, and made for a purpose. It has a job that it can do. It has a purpose for it. And that is mainly to drill holes. And sometimes if it has a hammer drill on it, it'll hammer drill in concrete. And then you can put buffer wheels on it. You can put sanders on it. You can put chisels on it. You can put grinders on it. And it'll go around and do all that it was designed to do. And, and here it is. And here it sits. But we got a problem. It ain't got no power. It's useless. This is the life of believers. If we don't have any power, we're useless. We can't fight the battle. We can't win the war or win the battles. And we can't be an overcomer and can't be a conqueror. When Paul said we're more than conquerors, if we don't have the power, you got to get connected to the power source. And when we get connected to the power source, wow, does this baby go. Amen? Now it becomes functional. Now it's able to do what it was designed to do and fulfill its purpose. What it becomes why? It's connected to the power source. But when it gets disconnected from the power source, all I have is a drill motor that's useless. It doesn't do anything. But here's what happens with a lot of believers. We get connected at first, and we've got the power, but all of a sudden we allow things to come into our lives, circumstances, and guess what happens? We begin to get weaker and weaker and weaker till we have no power because we've come disconnected. What is it that causes us to... lose the power? I think we see that in the lives of these apostles here of what took place in this passage of Scripture because God gave them all power and authority over basically everything. And they get down to a man that has a son that has a demon in him. And the man says, Jesus, I asked your cream of the crop. I asked your 12 disciples to cast out this demon out of my boy. And they could not. What happened? Let's pray. Father, help us today, Lord. We're in a warfare. We're in a battle. And we've got circumstances all around us, situations. We're being conquered and overcome when we are more than conquerors, Paul says. And John says we can be overcomers. And Jesus has given us all power and authority. But we've lost it. We're slowing down. We're dwindling down in our power. And we've got a power shortage today in the lives of believers and in the church. We need to get it back. Father, help us today to see what caused the power shortage in the disciples. And how they lost it when they had it. I pray it will be a blessing to us. A help to us today. That we can have victory. And we can live in victory today. Lord may you save souls today. Thank you for what you've done in this place already. And what we've heard. Father help me to be careful with my words. Father now give us that power that we need. Lord that we can be connected to the power source. In order to deliver this message. Father may souls be saved as a result of it. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus name. Amen. As I went down through this today, even myself, I began to think, I says, now, there's times that I'm not having victory. There's times that I'm being overcome rather than overcoming. There's times that I've been conquered and not conquering. And so I had to go through this and say, okay, where is it that I'm short or where I'm falling short at? Or what is it that's absolutely missing in my life that would cause these things? 
And I think we see them in the lives of these apostles here. As you go through them, you might want to mark one down, write it down, whatever, and so forth. But let's start off right here in uh, verse number 10. All right, you've got the idea of what's going on. Verse number 10. And the apostles, when they were returned, told him all that they had done. What do you think the first one was? Pride. Notice they came back. Jesus sent them out. And they went out. And rather than coming back and giving God the glory, giving Jesus the praise and the glory, and giving Him all the credit for what God had done, what Jesus had done in and through them, it was all about me. Look what I've done. Look how many demons I cast out. Look how many people I healed in the sick. And look how many people I led to Christ preaching the gospel. Man, I'll tell you what, I'm something else. Look what I have done. And what happens, pride gets in our lives. And I want to tell you something. When you get pride, you're going to wind down. Pride kept them from being and having all that God would have them to do. How many of you believe that? Pride. They told him, Jesus, notice all that they had done. Folks, we don't need to be telling anybody what we've done around here. We need to be telling everybody what Jesus has done around here, what Jesus is doing, what Jesus is going to be doing, and give Him all the praise and the glory. Don't let pride get in the way because, let me tell you something, if you're being defeated and you're not conquering or overcoming, it could be because there's a little bit of pride in your life. Now, say that can't happen. Hey, it happened to the twelve. It happened to the chosen group, the, 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 the green berets here, you know, the, the cream of the crop. Now, if it can happen to them, it can happen to us. Because after all, I'm called. After all, I'm a disciple. After all, Jesus has given me all power and authority. But this is why aren't we having victory? Why aren't we overcoming? Why aren't we conquering? Well, maybe it's because we've got a little bit too much of uh, rooster in us, you know. And uh, if you want those, you have to go over to Ted Neiden's house. Do you still have one? Oh, it's over at Robert's house now. You have to go to Robert. He's being traded. Uh, Tony, you still got yours? Okay, Jack, you still got yours? Who else got a rooster? Oh, Sharon. Oh, yes, there they are. Oh, the roosters. There they are. Look at the roosters over there. Amen. Boy, you roosters look good today. Praise God. Let's not be going around crowing and tooting our horn. Amen. Let's give Jesus all the praise and all the glory. Uh, there's too many preachers today even to get in the pulpit or you get around them and it's I, 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 I. I did this, I did that, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I, I, I. And it's all about them rather than about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I don't care how good and how sweet it may sound or look, I'm telling you what's happening. They're losing their power because it's all about pride. All right, let's look at a second one here. Well, let me give you some verses. What's the Bible says? Only pride cometh contention. But with a well-advised is wisdom. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before fall. 1 John 2, 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and here it is, the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And by the way, in Proverbs chapter 6, 17 and 18, the Bible says, Yea, these six sins God hates, yea, seven, is an abomination. And the first one is a proud look. God hates pride. Get rid of it because you're losing your power. And if you got too much of it, you done lost your power. You see, be careful with pride. Let's look at another one, verse 12. You'll like these. Mark them down. Write them in your Bible. And when the day began to wear away, then came, here they come. Here comes the green braids. Here comes the, the chosen 12. Here comes the cream of the crop. They said unto him, send the multitude away. What, what? Now, wait a minute. Folks, what are we in the business here for? The ministry is about people. See, they had an attitude towards others. The first thing they had, which I didn't give to you, they had an attitude towards themselves. Number one there, they had an attitude towards themselves, each other, and that was an attitude of pride. Now they've got an attitude about others. Hey, wait a minute, folks. The ministry is people. People are the ministry. That's what the ministry is all about. We're not to send them away. We're to go out and get them and bring them in. We're to go and invite them and bring them in and, and, and ask them to come in. Not send them away. Folks, the ministry is all about people. Matter of fact, look what happens. What happened? To them? I'll tell you what happened to them. They lost their vision. They lost their vision. And the Bible says when we lose our vision, what? The people perish. 
See, if we lose our vision here, folks, the people are going to perish. We can't lose our vision. And our vision has to go further than the four walls of this church. Our vision has got to go further than the doors outside. Our vision has to go into Jerusalem. Our vision has to go into Judea and to Samaria and to the othermost parts of the earth is where our vision has to go to reach people for Christ. Because it's people is ministry. Ministry is people. We're not to send them away. We're to invite them to come in. Come all ye that are heavy laden and laden down and I will give you rest. Jesus said all that come unto me I will in no wise cast out, folks. Go out into the highways and the byways and the city and the lanes and the hedges and compel them to come in. And that here these boys wanted to send them away. Let's not lose our vision. If we lose our vision we're going to lose our power. Are you with me? Come on now. We will. And that's why we need to expand the ministries of this church. That's why we need to go further with the media ministry that God has given to us. A tool that he's put in our... See, God's given us a media ministry. And the last thing he wants for it to do is to... It'll happen if we lose our vision. We want to keep our vision. Because we have a multitude of people to reach... So if you, if you have a problem today and you're not having power, you're not having victory, you're not, maybe because you've lost your vision. Your burden for the lost. Your burden to reach wind and lost souls that are lost without Christ. Folks, don't ever get the attitude here at the church, us four and no more. Don't ever get that attitude, us four and no more. We got our little clique and our little band here. Uh-uh, no, 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 no. We are to go out into the highways and the byways and the hedges and compel them to come in. And Jesus said, why? So that my house may be filled. Let's don't lose our vision. You see, send them away. We forgot about people. We're in the people business. They lost their vision. All right, let's look at the third one here, verse 18. Verse 18. Now, you'll like this one. And you're going to see the progression of this in verse 18. And it came to pass when he, that is Jesus, was, what? Talk to me. Alone, alone, praying. Now notice, his disciples were with him. There's an attitude going on here in their prayer life. And I want to tell you something. Much prayer, much power. Little prayer, little power. power no prayer, no power. How's your prayer life today? Is it checked up? Is it daily? Do you have a time, a set-aside time? See, without prayer, folks, you're going to have no power. No power, no prayer. Just that simple. These guys had an attitude about their prayer life. How many of you have ever been to a prayer meeting and felt you were the only one there? Huh? I've showed up to them and felt like I was the only one there. And we're supposed to be praying and everybody's talking. And, and there's a 20, 30, 40 minute fellowship going on when we were supposed to pray at 7 o'clock and now it's a quarter to 8 and nobody's even prayed yet and I've been there in a prayer meeting where it seems like I'm the only one praying and nobody else is praying folks that's what we're there for is to pray can you imagine Jesus went to pray and he's alone yet the disciples were with him and he's the only one praying folks we got to get back to praying I mean daily weekly Every day, pray without ceasing and cease not to pray. I, I ought that men ought everywhere to pray, everywhere, all times. Pray without ceasing, praying always. We need to be praying because prayer is where our power comes from. But I want to tell you something if we're heavy into praying, we're going to have a lot of power. But if we stop praying, we're not going to have any power. And these guys, remember now what happened? They were given everything, and in verse 40 says they couldn't do it. They lost their power. Because I believe they had an attitude about their prayer life. He was alone, even though they were with him. And let me tell you something. How many of you believe prayer changes things? Watch this. Watch what happens when Jesus is praying, even though he's alone, and those guys are with him. He went into a mountain, up into a mountain to pray, and he took Peter, James, and John with him there in verse 28. He took the three of them this time. And he went up to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. 
And behold, there talked with him two men which had been dead over a thousand years, Moses and Elijah. Now remember, Moses represents the resurrection and Elijah represents the rapture of the church. There's the rapture and the, and the resurrection right there combined. And here these two men were in the Shekinah glory cloud of God. And I mean, I'll tell you what, and, and, I'll tell you, and Jesus was changed. You know why? Because prayer will change things. Prayer will change your attitude. Prayer will change the things in this church. Prayer will get your power back. Prayer will help you get the victory over the things that you're going against and become an overcomer and a conqueror rather than being conquered and overcome. Through prayer. Prayer. Man, I'll tell you, you believe prayer changes things. Well, it won't if you don't pray. See, if you got power, keep praying. If you don't have it, then get, get it changed. How do you change it? Pray. Get back to praying. Praying. Look, here's another one. Now, you see where it leads to. Now, they're still in the same place here. We're on the Mount of Transfiguration. What's going on? Okay, so get the picture here. All right? Now, watch. This is great. Who appeared. Now, this is Moses and Elijah who appeared in glory, verse 31, <laughs> and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. They had come to minister to the Lord Jesus Christ and to have a fantastic service on the mountain there. I mean, a, you talk about a spirit-filled service. You talk about a glory service to be there when the Shekinah glory cloud of God shows up. Wow. What a worship service. Wouldn't it be that one of these days God would come and fill this place with His glory? Amen. Have a series of messages on return the glory. Glory to God, bring back the glory. The last thing we want is for God to write Ichabod on the church that the glory of the Lord has departed. No, no. Oh, God, don't depart from this place. I pray and beg you in Jesus' name, pour out your glory in this place. Let us see your glory in this place. So that's what's going on. But Peter and they that were with him were who? James and John. Oh, circle the next phrase. We're heavy with sleep. Here's the worship service going on. And these guys are asleep. Oh, preacher, don't go that route. <laughs> See, they had an attitude about worship. Can you imagine, Brother Ted, being on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus himself, and then all of a sudden two guys of the Old Testament, been dead for a long time, appeared in glory and talking to Jesus, and the Shekinah glory cloud of God is hovering around over on that mountain, and you're all there fast asleep. I want to tell you something, the church is asleep today. People are coming to church today asleep. You know what happened to these guys? I'm telling you, that would have been the most exciting, exuberating, thrilling service you could ever go to in your life, friend. I want to tell you something. And they didn't have a rock band there. They didn't have belly dancers. They didn't have ballerinas. They weren't flying people across the platform. I want to tell you what, they didn't have the strobe lights going. There wasn't the pyro. Oh, there was smoke, but it wasn't from the pyro, guys. It was from the Holy Ghost of God. And I'm talking about a service that ought to motivate you, that ought to excite you, that ought to build some enthusiasm up in you. They had lost their worship. They had an attitude about worship. They had lost their enthusiasm enthusiasm about worship and today God's people are dead when it comes to worship folks I don't need all that other stuff that I just talked about to get enthused about the word of God all I need is the word of God to get me motivated and excited and enthusiastic boy you read about what's going on and you start thinking about what happened and the fact that you could be there and been there with those guys I tell you this Bible ought to excite you the word of God ought to motivate you you ought to come here ready to shout and sing and, and, and praise the Lord because the word of God's going to motivate you the word of God's going to excite you the word of God's going to bring you closer to Christ the word of God's going to see people saved and we come here and we're just half dead because if we don't have the world to entertain us and to provide all the other stuff that goes along with it, ah, church is boring. They didn't do nothing over there today but preach the gospel. Ah, oh, church is boring. They didn't do nothing but take the King James Bible and preach verse by verse out of it. And I got so tired I went to sleep. No wonder you're living a defeated life. I said, boy, I'll tell you something. You didn't just lose the power. You came unconnected. Man, it's time to come to church and get motivated. Don't go to sleep. Get excited about church. Don't come here half asleep. And I've seen some of you sleeping. And some of you sleep with your eyes open. You're amazing. I'll tell you, now, some of you can really nod off. And the hit, old chin hits the chest here. And sometimes we can hear even some noises coming out. You know, I mean, the Bible said these guys were heavy sleeping. 
Can you imagine that in a Shekinah glory service and they're over there snoring? <laughs> breathe, man, breathe. <sighs> but some of you sit there and I'm going, are you sleeping? <laughs> hey! So I start watching your chest to see if it's moving. Because if not, I want to call somebody to be some mouth to mouth or do something. You know, get excited about the things of God. Get excited about this book. You never know when God's going to show up. I mean, really show up. He's here today in the presence of the Lord and His Holy Spirit. But you never know when the Spirit of God's going to pour out some Shekinah glory in here. You never know when God's going to get a hold of a brother or sister in Christ and fill him with His glory and with His power. And you don't never know when a revival's going to break out because somebody gets convicted of their sin and God gets a hold of them and it starts getting a hold of the church and revival breaks out. Oh, look to be to God. But oh, not if we're sleeping. You're going to miss out on what God does sleeping. Don't have a rotten attitude about worship. Oh, we gotta go to church today. Oh my goodness, it's oh, it's raining or the sun's out. I want to go to the beach. I want to go to the park. The ball game's on. Oh, we gotta go to church. And of all things, we gotta go listen to that guy. You got a problem with your worship service, and you know what? You've lost your power. I'm having fun today. I felt good coming today. I was excited about this message because I know this is going to help somebody here and I know it's going to help somebody out there that's listening because God's people are living defeated. They're being conquered and overcome and they don't have to be because God's given you all power and authority over. He has equipped you to do and be everything you need to be and do in Jesus' name. Amen. And it's only these things that are keeping us from doing it. It really is. Well, let's see. Now, here, oh, you're going you're to love the next one. Now, we're just coming off the mount. Just think about that now. We're just coming off the mount, Brother Ted. This is kind of glory worship service that these guys are. <sighs> verse 46. Drop over to verse 46 now. We're going to really jump over here. Then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be the greatest. Am I reading the Bible right here? Can you imagine? They have a problem with themselves with pride already. Okay, they're having a problem with others to send them away. Their prayer life is in shambles. Their worship, they just, they're just they so bored with worship, they've gone to sleep. And now, here they go, they got an attitude between themselves. Well, after all, which one of us is the greatest? Well, how many demons did you cast out on your trip? Well, so many. And how many raised did you raise from the dead? How many uh, sick did you heal and cure? How many people did you get saved? Oh, man, we had thousands saved. Well, how many? Well, and evangelistic speaking, we had thousands saved. All right, some because Peter's an evangelist, you understand? All right. I mean, who's the greatest? Folks, this isn't about me and you. There's nobody great in this place. You understand that? Jesus said, if you want to be great, you've got to become the least. He said, you want to be first, you've got to become the last. And the Bible says, if you want God to exalt you, you better walk humbly before your God. And God will exalt you in due time if you want to get lifted up, my friend. You understand that? What does God require of man? Three things. That he, love, that he do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly before thy God. Never mind about who's the greatest. Well, I'm the best song leader. I'm the best pianist. I'm the best steel guitar player. Don't ask me to play that thing. You say, I'm the best soloist in the church. I'm the best preacher. Come on, folks. Get off of the hobby horse. There's nobody great in this church. The only great person here is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's not here physically. He's only here in spirit, living inside of us. He is the great one. Not you and I. Can you imagine this? All that they were going through and they're strutting around. Well, I wonder which one of us is the main rooster. And I bet they had a cockadoo a crowing contest to see who could cockadoodle do the hot loudest and the longest to win the contest. And that one would become the greatest of all. Folks, this isn't about you and I becoming great. This is about people getting saved. This is about the, the gospel going out and reaching the lost. Not about which one of us is the best of anything around here. There's nobody better than nobody around here. You understand that? Everybody around here works together as a team. We function as a team. Our purpose is to win souls and to reach souls. And whatever we got to do to do it, if that's vacuuming the floors, cleaning out the toilets, raking the leaves, that's just as important as this preacher standing here today, this morning in this pulpit. I'm not greater than anybody else and nobody's greater than me out here. You understand that? We're all on the same plane. Amen. 
Wow, they were on a power trip, brother, I'll tell you. I'll tell you, their ego was flying so high, it was unbelievable. Can you see that? That's a power trip, folks. That's an ego trip. They're reasoning amongst themselves. Which one of us is the greatest? Now remember, this is from the twelve. This is the chosen crop, man. Just come off the mountain of the Mount Transfiguration. And now they're all wondering who's the greatest. My, my, my. No wonder we're living in defeat. No wonder there's no victory in our lives. No wonder we're being overcome and not overcoming. No wonder we're being overwhelmed and not overwhelming. Because you see, we've lost our power. Some of you are kind of... Hot, cold, up, down. Oh my. Look what Romans 12, 3 says concerning this thing of being the greatest. Paul says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you. How many? Every man. It's every person here. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. But you need to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. All the greatest. We got two more and we're finished. Look at verse 49. You, you see the progression going here, don't you? You see the progression. It goes from pr 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 pride about themselves to, to an attitude about others. I ah, send them away, man. We ain't got time. Matter of fact, you know why they send them away? Because we're so much in love with ourselves, we don't have to think about anybody else. But look at here, verse 49. I want you to see a sixth one here, a sixth attitude. Pick it out. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him. Why? Because he followeth not with us. Uh-oh. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. Here's one we need to be careful of. Here's one that pastors need to be careful of. I make no apology that I'm an independent Baptist. Fundamental, independent, pre-trib, pre-millennial, virgin born, deity of Christ, Jesus is God, incarnate in the flesh, resurrection, all the major doctrines of the Bible with no apology. And if I had my way, I'd make everybody a Baptist. But I want to tell you something. There are other people out there that are reaching people for Christ. There are other people that are winning souls. There are other people that are establishing great churches for God. Now don't get me wrong. I, I'm not for all this false doctrine and false teaching and all this other stuff going on. But I'm talking about good men with good names that have good reputations. And many of them when they started out were Baptists. But they changed the name to go into the communities they were in and so forth. And I'll let you tell them, let them tell you why they did or whatever. And they can tell Jesus why they switched over when they get to glory. All right, amen. I'm not switching. But it doesn't matter. How dare us to go out here and tell this person they can't cast out a demon in Jesus' name or preach the gospel because they're not one of us. See, they had a judgmental spirit is what they had. They had a judgmental attitude. They were judging this other group or this other one who was casting out the devils in Jesus' name. And we forbade him. And we told him, you can't do that because you're not following us. You don't look like us. You don't talk like us. You don't smell like us. You don't act like us. You're not one of the groups. So, hey, man, you, you're not allowed to do this. You can't be doing that. And Jesus said, now, listen to me, fellas. Let me tell you something. Those that are not against us are for us. There was another group doing that one time. They were casting out demons and preaching. And the apostles got all upset again about it. And then he said, look at this, Lord. Look at these guys over here. They're doing this for money. And Jesus said, that's all right. They're not against us. They're for us. He said, I'll deal with them later. Jesus, take care of them later. You don't have to worry about that. But folks, there are people over around the world right now where multitudes of hundreds of thousands of souls are being saved in Korea right now, my friend. And they're not Baptists. There's, a hundred, there's hundreds of thousands of souls being saved in China that are not Baptists. I mean, I wish they were, but my friend, there are other people out there that are winning souls for Christ and doing the work of God. And some of them, I can't even touch the hem of their garment. Let's be careful how we judge others. As pastors, we have to be careful with that. I have to be careful with that. Because, you see, if I'm not, I'm going to lose my power. 
got quiet in here. How come it always gets quiet when it's on the preacher? <laughs> Let's look at the last one. You're really going to like this one. Are you ready for it? Let's not judge people, folks. Jesus said, judge not, least you be judged. For what judgment you measure it out, it shall be measured unto you. God didn't call us to judge. There's only one judge, the Bible says, and God has placed all judgment in the hands of Jesus Christ. He will be the judge. And right now, it's not time to judge. Now's a time of grace. There is a time of judgment coming when Jesus will judge, but not right now. It's a time of grace. Let's look at the last one, verse 54. You're really going to like this. We'll start in 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up and steadfastly. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. All right, it's time for the Calvary. It's time for the cross. They got to make their way to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into the village of the who, church? Now, who were the Samaritans? They were half-breeds. Half Jewish, half Gentile. Nobody liked them. The Jews didn't like them. The Samaritans didn't like them. But what in the world are they doing going through Samaria? But he sent them there to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. That's where he was going. So the Samaritans wouldn't receive him because they sensed the fact he didn't really come here to see us. He didn't really come by here to meet with us and fellowship with us. He's just passing through because he's on his way to Jerusalem. His face is set to Jerusalem. He's going to the cross. He's going to Calvary. So therefore, we don't want anything to do with you. Now watch this. Be careful. And when his disciples... James and John saw this. They said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did? Now, wait a minute. If you haven't got enough power to cast out a demon, how are you going to have enough power to call down fire from heaven? Not only that, they had a vengeful spirit. They had an attitude of vengefulness. Man, let's just kill them all and let God sort them out. Fry them. Jesus, Master. They wouldn't receive you. And of course, you know who they were really thinking of? Themselves. Because he sent them ahead to make ready. And they wouldn't receive James and John. And it really wasn't about Jesus, I don't believe. I believe the problem was that they didn't receive them. And so they said, Jesus, Lord. How about if we just call down a little fire from heaven right now and just fry them all and make crispy critters out of them? Wow, what kind of attitude is that, folks? How do you expect to have power when you want to go around frying everybody? God didn't call you to fry people. God didn't call you to burn people. Listen to me. You better think, think real serious about that when it comes to judging and frying and burning people. Because I want to tell you something. 90% of the world is lost and going to a devil's hell that are going to burn in a literal fire forever and forever and forever and forever for all eternity. We're, not, we're to rescue them from the fire, not put them in it. You know what they should have done? They should have recalled back to what they just came off of, the Mount of Transfiguration, and said, Master, how about if we call down Moses and Elijah again? How about if we call down the Shekinah glory crowd and save Samaria and have a revival? But instead, they had a vengeful attitude. Let's just fry them. Now, I want to tell you something, boy. They wanted to call fire down from heaven. They wanted to consume them. So, church, how do we get the power back? If we've lost it. If you go over to Mark's gospel, Mark 29, 29, we have the same account. But the first thing you got to do is repentance. Repentance. See, if you're not having victory today, you're not overcoming, you're not conquering, you're not overwhelming, you're winning, you're losing the battles, my friend. It could be because you've lost the power. You know what you got to do? You need to repent. You need to repent. Now, I know we don't want to hear that word, but we all need to repent. Sometimes a little more than others. Amen? There's nothing wrong with repentance. It's good. When we're not willing to repent, we've got to go back to the first thing. We've got pride. Ooh. You see, repentance. But Jesus said to these fellows in Mark chapter 9, verse 29, we have the same account. They left the man's house. They went out. And they came up to the Lord privately. And they said, Lord, how come we couldn't cast out that demon? They asked him. And Jesus said, because this kind, speaking of power, this kind of power, fellas, is going to come but by past fasting and prayer. 
You want that kind of power, fellas? You're going to have to pray and fast. You can't have this kind of attitude going on in your life. You know why? Because you guys have been disconnected from the source. That's why you got no power. And the only way you're going to get connected to the source is, first of all, you've got to repent. Now, I went through these seven things, and I had to search my heart. God, are there any of these things in my life that's causing me to lose power, not to have it? Did I repent of it now? I confess it. Cast, get, get rid of it. Get it out of there, because, God, I want your power. I desire your power. And he says, not a problem. You repent and get reconnected. Amen. See, when you get reconnected, you're charged and ready to go. You know what some of you need to do? You know what happens when this thing wears down? And it don't go no more? I take it over and I put it in the charger. And the charger is connected to the power source. Are y'all getting this? And pretty soon it gets charged back up. We're ready to go again. You see, some of you have lost your charge. Your power's been dwindling. There's a power shortage. It's being drained. These things will drain it. These will drain the power from you. They really will. You need to get plugged back in to the source and get recharged. And if you've lost it completely, I definitely get back in connected to the power source. Because the power comes from Jesus. The power comes from heaven. And that's where you get it. Get charged again. Your battery's running down. You're struggling. Stress, finances, worry, frustration, anxiety. Your circumstances are overwhelming. Your situations you're facing you seem to be bogging you down. Could be because you've lost some power. And your power's dwindling. I suggest get connected again. Get it back. Aren't you glad we can get it back? That's what's great. We can get it back. You know when these guys got it back? Remember now, we're almost at Calvary. And guess what? They even lost it at Calvary. Because Peter rejected the Lord three times and even cursed him. Peter lost his power. And yet God gave Peter the keys keys to the kingdom. But did Peter get it back? Oh yeah. He went out and he wept bitterly. And Jesus said, matter of fact, Peter, when thou gets converted, go and strengthen thy brethren. You know when they got it back? They got it back on the day of Pentecost. Because they were hidden. They ran out. They were afraid. Even after the Lord had saw them and visited with them in the house at least twice. And several other times. And Peter said, that's it, I'm going fishing. And you guys want to go with me? And seven of them went out and went in the boat and went fishing. When all of a sudden John says, Peter, isn't that Jesus on the shore? Nah, I'm telling you, that's Jesus. Peter dove out of the boat naked and swam faster than Mark Pitts, Spitz, whatever his name is, and got to the shoreline and ran to Jesus because it was the master. Peter was going to do He wanted to get it back. And when Pentecost came, he said, you go and tarry and wait in Jerusalem until you be endued with Dunamis. Dynamite. And then when you do, what did he do? He equipped them again for what they needed to do the task that was ahead of them. And that was to turn their world upside down for Christ. And that's what they went and did because they got the power back. Bow your heads and close your eyes. There's some today that maybe have never gotten the power to start with. You've never had it to begin with because you, haven't, because you haven't responded to the call of Christ to come and receive the gospel and receive the Lord Jesus and get saved and born again. Now if that's your condition this morning and you're here, let me strongly encourage you to come and to be saved and born again and, and get connected for the first time to the power source, the Lord Jesus Christ and how do you get connected? Through the new birth. The birth, the new birth, experiencing that birth from above by the Holy Spirit of God. Repent of your sins and confess Christ as Lord and invite Him into your heart and life and 
to get saved and born again. If you've never done that, let me encourage you to do that. My dear friend, you believers that are here today, if you've been, uh, been, been being beat up and, and, and you've been struggling and you've been losing the battles and you've been being overcome and overwhelmed and, 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 and not conquering and not having victory, then evaluate that today and get it back. Get charged back again. Come and, and repent of those things and, and stand, sit, to all, whatever you want to do. But come and, and deal with God about it. Nobody's going to care. Nobody's worried about it because everybody has to deal with it. Those of you that are watching by television right now, internet, iTubes, iPhones, iPads, tablets, listening on the radio, friend, why not come to Christ today and receive Him as your Lord and Savior and get connected to the power source, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ through the new birth. That's your desire of your heart today. Would you bow your heads wherever you're at, wherever you're watching, wherever you're listening? Pray with us. It's not the prayer that saves you now. It's putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But pray this with us. Dear God, that's right. Go ahead. I confess with my mouth you are the Lord. I confess that I'm a sinner and I've sinned against you, God. And I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me. He will, my friend. He will. I do now believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. He took my place. He paid my sin debt. I believe He was buried, that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And right now by faith, I do call upon You, Lord Jesus, and receive You into my heart and life to be my Lord and my Savior and to take me to heaven someday when I die and I pray this prayer in Jesus name amen and amen God bless you we'll trust many of you came to Christ today and those of you that are saved get the power back get it back become and do all that God's equipped you and called you to do but you need the power get it back Because God's people are living defeated. They're being conquered and overcome. And they don't have to be because God's given you all power and authority. over. He has equipped you to do and be everything you need to be and do. In Jesus' name.